Welcome to Private Banking Strategies Podcast with Vance Lowe and Seth Hicks, your secret weapon to protect your assets and never have to start over financially again. Vance and Seth help high net worth individuals, families, business owners, and investors structure an asset protected, tax free fortress for their families. Learn how to keep what you earn and use the velocity of money to create your own private banking system. Join us on this journey as we explore the secret strategies of the rich and political elite and help you take total control of your financial security. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Private Banking Strategies with Vance Lowe and Seth Hicks. Vance, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. All right, Seth, what's going on? Doing great, Eric. Thanks for having us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, this is your podcast, man. Um, I'm excited because you've got another great topic today. You actually teased it a little bit on that last podcast, Vance. What are we talking about today? We're going to take a look an in-depth look and get our brains working on some other things that these special contracts can do in our lives to turn us from us working for money to passive income. And we're going to use uh, an example of college tuition today. Okay. All right. I'm interested. Where do we start? All right. We're going to take another chapter out of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And this section can be found, and you can get all of your numbers and statistics and his view on uh, college versus not college um, in his book, uh, starting on page, uh, I think, 75 of Give the folks printed, the title of the book, Vance. Uh, Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash, uh, fifth edition. You can get that book from Amazon, you know, virtually anywhere. So anyway, what he's doing, like we did last time, is that uh, we covered the topic of, hey, I'm uninsurable, so I can't do the strategy, which we debunked. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you want to listen to that, listen to the podcast uh, that was uh, just released before this one. So we're now going to take that a, a step farther. What if we use the money? What if we just set up a, a scenario here and instead of forcing our kids to college that, hey, you are going to college, blah, 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 that we let the child choose and he chooses. He knows what he wants to do. He's going to go to trade school. Uh, he can go down to a local place and we can save that tuition. And let's put the uh, uh, point, uh, the cost point of the education of $20,000 a year. Um, college education. And instead of putting that towards college, let's still put it, but we're, let's put it into one of these high paying uh, cash value policies and see what that looks like. So here we've got, uh, I guess, an 18 year old boy we're going to go with, and we're going to put $20,000 a year for four years into one of these contracts. And then we're going to stop altogether. We're not going to pay another dime because he would have normally been out of college at that time, got his degree and whatever else. So we put into college and he can get his career that way or he can go to a trade school and we put the money here. The only difference from this podcast illustration to what we talked about uh, with the uninsurable guy when he, he is going to practice a little bit of banking because at the end of four years, starting his fifth year, there's $65,000 in cash value in this contract. He um, goes to trade school. He gets certified. He starts his job. He needs a car. He can start self-banking. He can pull out money. He can borrow money from this contract buy the car and paying himself back every four years. And in this illustration, he's pulling out, I think his purchase price is $21,450. He's paying himself back um, about uh, $6,500 a year for four years. And then he's going to repeat that. Okay, but as far as the rest of the money goes and uh, any other type of banking or borrowing from that contract, 
He's doing nothing. Okay? So the policy is on his life, by the way. And he lets, the parents let uh, the insurance carriers manage this contract. Um, this is a special contract. It's put together a special way with different components to really create a lot of uh, high cash value, not only at the beginning, but all the way um, throughout. And they take the dividends and they put it into the policy in purchasing additional paid up uh, uh, insurance. When he turns age 70, there's over $2.6 million in this account. Uh, Seth, remember how many years they put the premium in? Four. Okay. How on earth can a policy get to $2.4 million? Give us some some reasoning behind this, because a lot of people aren't going to believe these numbers. Well, it, it goes back to the compounding nature uh, of these policies. They're in a tax-free environment and the, uh, the the compounding is parabolic as you get towards the end of the policy. And we discussed this in the last episode, uh, how a penny doubled every day for 30 days turns into over $5 million. And uh, that is stunning um, when you think about it. And especially with the life insurance management of assets, which is stellar, probably second to none in the market as far as managing assets and the dividends that they pay that compound into your your cash value when it's structured properly. That's how you get to those those numbers. But they're uh, on in this book, Becoming Your Own Banker, in the, the back of the book where we're describing this hypothetical, you've got the, the illustrations and the actual tables that show you the growth year after year on page 76 for those of the audience that have the book or get the book. Yeah. So what we're trying to share with is that, uh, you know, money's earned one of two ways. People at work or money at work, okay? And for those who conquer money, they're doing a formula and obeying all the laws and the rules, but they put more and more of their money while they are working to work, uh, financing things that they need. Instead of being liabilities, they make them assets, and they put more and more of the money out to work. Now, they don't have to risk money in the stock market. Uh, that's what the beauty of this uh, self-banking is and the strategy is, is growth without risk and growth without triggering taxable events. It's also nice to know when you're actually looking at these graphs, and I'm looking at them right now, the dividends paid over a 53-year period. Remember, from 18 to, um, I guess it's, yeah, year one, 18, and uh, policy year uh, 53, he's 70. Um, $2.1 million was paid in dividends alone. The cash value is uh, 523000 and some change. You know what that's going to provide for him? from 70 for the rest of his life, that's going to provide a tax-free income, which is passive income that's not taxable, of $150,000 a year. So, Eric, what's a normal lifespan? Well, right up until you die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. For, for guys, I think it's, what, 83, 82, something like that? Yeah. So let's say age 85, you know, we'll give him the okay. benefit of the doubt. Okay. He will have a negative effect. I mean, remember we paid 80,000 into the policy and he will have gotten that back and an additional $2.2 million paid out from the compounding growth. And then he will pass to errors. $3.8 million. Now, if they do the same thing, it's already triggered for his family and his grandkids uh, a way to get passive income that will never 
quit because this is what we're we're really looking into these contracts to do and it might just be luckily a choice you know a lot of people they want to go to college family want to go to college sometimes there are careers that can only be approached and be successful you know with college degrees but in the i think in the vast majority a lot can be done outside of the colleges and some of that money that was going to be spent that has been saved by parents all this time could be put to putting the money to work immediately instead of spending it uh, possibly on that education. But that's up for the individual families. So I want to change this analysis just a little bit and let's look at the individual who wants to be in the medical field. And in order to be in the medical field, it would require a college education of four years and then medical school for an additional four years. And so let's keep it at uh, $20,000, but instead of for four years, it would be for eight years. Now, we can do the math and, you know, reality, I'm, I'm not worried about that. We have to be able to share something. So this is in the book, and it's easy to follow. And so she decides to go to a trade school and take um, courses that will get her into the medical field a different way and save the money that her parents was going to put into college uh, education. Um, maybe she has to go to work or, or, or whatever else to earn her tuition to go to uh, uh, trade school. But nevertheless, this will be the scenario. And, you know, I think I'll, I'll break right here and maybe tell you a little story that's, that's true about uh, my family. I was taught by my parents that I need to go to college get a college degree, and if you get a college degree, then the world, you know, will lay at your feet. And uh, all of us, all of my friends and peers around me and, and, and stuff like that, we all grew up that way. So I didn't do that. I started, I did win a scholarship, but I decided to do a a, a church missionary uh, deal for two years, but I actually went into the service first, I joined the National Guard, and went in for my training because I had a low draft number. It kind of tells you how old I am when they were drafting people uh, into Vietnam. So my uh, college was pushed way back. I came home and got married right off the bat and went uh, and started up college. But then I started having children, and, you know, one thing led to another. So as I educated myself from that point forward, and we had four children, it was the attitude, okay, we want to provide college for our kids if they wanted to go to college. And my oldest son decided, you know, I don't need to go to college. I don't want to go to college. I'm not that smart, but I want to get into the computer field. I love computers. I want to go to just trade uh, schools, uh, get my certifications, and then I can find a job that way. I said, go for it. Now, my second son, he got the governor's award. He was that smart when he graduated high school. He got all kinds of scholarships, so he went to college. And my daughter, who was next, was under Adam's um, shadow. She was ever bit of smart. But because he overshadowed her, she never got the recognition or anything else. She won scholarships and went to uh, college. And then my youngest, he said, well, if they went to college, I'm going to college. But you know what? I want to be a gemologist. So he went to college, and then he said, Dad, I need you to pay another tuition to a gemology school. So he hit me up for two college educations. Hmm. So I ended up paying four college educations for my kids. And long story short, and the reason I'm, I'm stating this, they each went out, they graduated, and they each went out and found their careers. And uh, the good thing is they're all employed. They're all making good income. 
But I just wanted to share with you that my son who decided not to go to college, he has never stopped educating. Every time a new computer system comes out or a new program, they send him to school to get certified in that and then in that and in the next one. And he works for a large bank change and keeping all of their systems up and running and his income is more than the other three kids put together. Do you see yourself in that story? Do you feel like you are generating a lot of revenue but are not moving forward as fast as you would like? Are you ready for help? Please call Private Banking Strategies at 817-200-4777 or visit us at www.privatebankingstrategies.com. So let's get into the second one. It's going to be $35,000 a year for eight years. Susie Q here, her annual tuition amount is, is $35,000. She was a younger generation, we'll call it. And uh, to add medical school and everything else, the average would be $35,000 a year. But instead of four years, it's going to go to eight years. Mm. Want us to notice at the end of eight years where she would probably begin a practice or anything else, she's got $339,000 in cash value. Now, she starts um, because in the medical field, uh, she wants to drive a better car. So she's going to finance a $37,500 car, pay herself back $11,375 a year. So the first year, the twenty six. 125 is after they've uh, she's made her payments. And that's why it's it's a negative. She borrowed the money that year. Mm. She paid back all but 26,000. And now she's paying back in the 11 and she's repeating that. You know, she could take that and literally buy 10 cars at $30,000 each and lease them to all the doctors who went to college you know, and into the hospital and have a huge income coming in just off of the lease payments uh, off of that. But be that here or there, the only banking that we're going to show again is her financing her one car every four years up until, what does it say here? She's 65, 66, and she buys her last car at uh, age 66. So in this illustration, again, the life insurance company manages everything for her. Uh, She doesn't have to worry about the stock market. Doesn't matter what the market does. Doesn't matter what the economy is doing or anything else. Uh, What matters is, is the guaranteed growth of the policy. And the only thing that's not guaranteed are the dividends. And fortunately, today, we get to deal with companies who up to this point and all the way out to companies that are as old as 200 years old have never missed a year of not paying profits. You're going back to the Civil War, all the world Mm. wars, all the Great Depressions, everything else. They've always paid profits out. So she decides to stop her work and live off of passive income and go do the things that she wants to do. Her income, because of the compounding effect, and uh, Seth, I'd again like you to reiterate here, uh, there's $550,000 and $10,000 of net cash value. How does that happen again? Through the compounding nature of these contracts, where year after year it compounds and grows uh, tax-free. So at the end of the cycle, it, it's parabolic in growth. And you said she's taking out $550,000 a year? Yes. Correct. She's partying, man. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is amazing. Wow, that's a huge amount. 
and she probably doesn't need it. Think of the banking. Think of the things that she could do, the potential mm -hmm. for good she could do with just her family and extended family or whatever else. The potential is incredible, and all she did, you know, she, it was her parents who put the money in. Okay, not her. She just financed her cars out of out of this contract and paid it back, you know, and then used cars. What if she financed her kids' education out of here? What if she did all this other? The numbers would be higher. Or what if she financed two cars? Mm -hmm. These numbers would be at least a million higher. And he proves that earlier in, he, in his book when he talks about car financing. So how risky... Seth, is this business to, you know, creditors or someone on the outside? Uh, I mean, this this looks like a low-hanging fruit for somebody to steal, right? Well, if it's structured properly uh, and it's asset protected in the appropriate jurisdiction. So um, whether you're in a particular state which protects it by law and the legislature has automatically uh, de declared it to be 100% uh, creditor uh, proof, or if you're in another state that doesn't have that legislation, you can sh structure it in a way with an irrevocable life insurance trust to to accomplish that. So it's it accomplishes the seven pillars, of course, like we we uh, discussed so many times, Eric, of asset protection, mm -hmm. uh, tax free growth, legacy transfer. Um, so it it actually acts as the perfect bank that's not subject to being taken. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, it's, you know, she doesn't have to worry about that unless she did something wrong. But she, you know, they, they did everything right. It's probably held with a trust or whatever else. And by the time she's age 85 or 15 years later, She's gotten all of the money that her parents put in. She's gotten all the money back that she paid for her cars over the years back uh, to the tune of $8,488,000 that she's pulled out of that policy income tax-free. Why is it income tax-free? Seth, kind of explain that to us. Well, Internal Revenue Code 7702 is the provision that controls uh, these contracts, along with various other types of financial instruments and retirement planning. And um, Internal Revenue Code 7702 is simply playing within the, the rules. So it, it's, uh, by law, uh, tax-free distribution. Uh, that's the beauty of this thing. So here's a situation. The parents could come up with $35,000 a year. Whether they borrowed it, however they got it, they did it for eight years. What this provides is a legacy for an extended family that just isn't going to quit. When she reaches age 85, at 68 years of being under this contract, she will pass to heirs in death benefit tax free 18 million plus dollars that's enough to literally fund a, a complete extended family's financial needs hopefully it's a big family they each had lots of kids and there's you know by the time she's 85 she's got 100 plus grandkids and great grandkids and we put a policy on each of those owned by the trust which is the bank now, everything that that family needs can be self-financed for the rest of their life. Welcome to the Rockefeller family mm -hmm. strategy. Now, nobody knows how what the wealth is of that family. Unfortunately, they're not Americans, so <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not a good thing. But uh, this is the potential of these contracts. Um, it's just, again, all about how we think. A lot of people, you know, um, my kids are going to college come heck or high water because it was an advantage to me and it will be an advantage to them. Fine. Okay. Some of them don't want their kids to go to college. 
uh, because they don't have the money to pay for it. They fall prey to the stuff that uh, is in high school in, um, you know, financing, uh, you know, student loans and, and whatever else uh, to get to go to college when um, easily a trade school might be have been a better por- proportion. Who knows what the scenario is? What I we're trying to point out is how do we get to passive income sooner than later? So, Eric, is this a short term or a long term strategy? Oh, long term, for sure. It's a lifetime strategy, isn't it? It's not a quick, get rich quick strategy. However, there is money immediately to be able to put to work, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Eric, you, you just said it was a, a long term strategy, and it is. It's just something that, uh, but even when we start, we can immediately put money to work by self financing some of the smaller items. And thus, all of this payment that comes back, if you look into these illustrations and and the podcast before, that money is coming back through, even if it's self-payment, doesn't matter. The banks always get the money back. Your bank's always going to get the money back. That money comes back to be used a second time. It's going to go buy more debt. And that money's going to come in off that first debt. Now we bought more debt. Money's going to come out off of that debt. So we're going to use money the th- three times, four times, five times. We don't have to come up with new money. The money's going to come back into the hoppers along with new money. And this is the compounding effect that Seth was talking about. This is how we get to this $10 million for Susie Q by the time she starts taking out passive income and having it grow to 18 million dollars it's the reuse of dollars not ever losing control over it but getting another dollar's worth of product or services every time we use them well here's the thing guys i mean and vance you asked me the question is this short term is this long term i truly think just i mean if you if the listener has listened to that last podcast and this one and probably a handful of others I think anybody who's really interested in this strategy, and this is just my opinion, but probably comes from an, a mindset of, I want to do well for my family generationally. I, you guys know that I have kids and I have grandkids now. I love this strategy. I love the, the way it's formatted because this is, you know, this is something that could set up my kids, my grandkids and great grandkids and whoever's beyond that, that I'm not even going to meet. And that's not something that was ever done in my family or my wife's family. God bless them. My, my parents worked hard. Her parents worked hard, but they never, ever accumulated anything to be able to pass on. And so I want to be able to do that. I think that people listening to this, that's their goal. That's something that they're looking at. And they're like, okay, a long-term strategy. I get it. And then you've got the flip side of the coin, the stuff that you were just talking about, creating businesses, creating investment opportunities using this money to to do that within you know the first couple of years that you're in this program to where you can actually then generate income based on you know the financing available you being the bank so i, I think that the heart is there you know for people that want to think long term to set their family up right for generations and then the brain kicks in and says i can actually make a good income off of this as well absolutely well absolutely. said and you can see that in the uh, we're going to make some resources available for our audience, uh, Eric, and Perfect. in the the spreadsheets that go through these numbers and show uh, the cash value uh, accumulation. You'll see as this policy matures uh, at year thirty and at year forty, and then down into the fiftieth year of the policy, it's it's adding like you know three quarters of a million dollars in mm-hmm. net cash value at a time at a per per year every year and it's important to really understand the value of this as a long-term strategy and how it far outweighs any type of other retirement plan or retirement strategy um it, it far outweighs the speculative nature of social security uh it far outweighs the speculative uh, uh, nature of how much you're going to be taxed 
in regular government sponsored retirement programs. So you don't have to deal with any of that. This isn't subject to taxation. It's um, and the reason that it's carved out in Internal Revenue Code 7702 is because the wealthy already utilize these strategies. Mm -hmm. And the politicians are to utilize these strategies. So um, it, it's it's kind of like a, a, a secret. You mm -hmm. know? I agree. I mean, it's, I've never known a politician <laughs> to, you know, kind of divulge all the secrets of how they're, you know, they have their money or where they have their money or how they use their money. That seems to be a secret all over the place. And and doesn't surprise me at all that this is a strategy that that folks in those circles would use and this not divulge because there is a benefit to them to keep people in a regular banking system into a regular humdrum right uh, existence where they're not gaining ground or they're not making major changes for their family uh, that's just my opinion uh, maybe a little cynical but just looking at the political spectrum over the last 10 15 20 years that's what i see Absolutely. I agree so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, anything else before we close this podcast out today? I think that's uh, enough food for thought today. All right. Great job, guys. I love the information. So much to digest. Um, Seth, where can people find those resources that you were talking about? PrivateBankingStrategies.com. It's PrivateBankingStrategies.com. And there we've got uh, a free book for our guests, which we call uh, What the Banks Don't Want You to Know. And therein, we peel back layer after layer on different issues, including compound growth and how that works, uh, and make that available to folks for free. And you can either read that or you can listen to it in an audio form. And also, as I've stated many times, we've got a robust asset base for folks that they can binge on podcast after podcast, mm -hmm. and they can sign up for our emails they can read blogs and really educate themselves as to how private banking strategies is uh, a necessity for every family's wealth growth. And we just want to make it available to as many people as we can reach. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time today and all the great education. Thank you so much, Eric. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Eric. You bet. Of course, our last thank you always goes to you, listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Private Banking Strategies podcast with Vance Lowe and Seth Hicks. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe down button below. This way, when Vance and Seth come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this actually helps others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Private Banking Strategies, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Did that story feel like it was about you? Do you feel you should be making more progress toward your financial goals? Do you feel stuck? Let us help you get unstuck. Are you ready to take action and get your own private bank? Please call Private Banking Strategies at 817-200-4777 or visit us at www.privatebankingstrategies.com. Thank you for listening to the Private Banking Strategies Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of private banking strategies. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.